Hey everybody, welcome to Atomic Game Theory. I am so excited for our show today. Uh, we've got some more game school coming at you. Uh, we are here to talk about two of my favorite games. We're going to break down, oh my gosh, uh, what happens when you cross the line, which is kind of a, I don't know, hopefully we get exactly what we want out of this. Um, these are two games that that have mastery involved in them, and I want to talk about that mastery and what happens when you become a master at these kind of games. Uh, my name is Richard. Um, throughout the show, if you have any questions, if you're watching on Twitch, make sure you post your questions in, in the chat, and you can also tweet them at me at Armelina, of course, anytime you like. I'll be checking those, and hopefully we'll be able to, I don't know, see what's going on. It's school, so get your questions answered. I'm a teacher. That's what we're up to. All right, let's get started today. Oh my gosh, I am so excited. Um, like I said, two of my favorite games, uh, I've been playing both of these for a very long time, I think, as long as I have been playing games. So uh, so I really want to jump into it. Um, I've been thinking about this for a few days now. Very excited about Scrabble, finally bringing Scrabble into our game theory mix. Um, you know, we don't. I don't talk about a lot of classic games. We talk about, like, Rise of Tribes and Vast and Machi Koro and these, these major, major games. Not games that have been around for, you know closing in on a century, but, uh, but Scrabble is one of my favorite games, and it is one of the ones that uh, broke my brain very, very early. Um, so let's let's dive into Scrabble. I hope you've all played Scrabble. I hope you've all played Scrabble with, uh, I don't know, a Scrabble monster <laughs> who, who uh, played words that you didn't know exactly what they were or anything like that, because uh, that's where we're going today. We're going to talk about some of those weird words. Um, so if you have never played Scrabble, Scrabble is classic. I'm so excited. I grabbed my copy of Scrabble today and I realized that all of my tiles were missing. They had been used for a project or I was doing probability stuff or who, who the heck knows what was going on. And I had to rush to borrow a copy and, uh, and I borrowed one from our good friends, the Scrimshaws, and they have the classic version of Scrabble that I had as a kid, uh, manufactured by Selchow and Ryder. Uh, long, long, long ago. Scrabble has a weird, wacky, wild history about who's been publishing it over the years. Uh, look, the rules are right here on the inside lid. This is the version I played as a kid, and I'm so happy to get to play with it again today. Um, this version came with a board, bright colors, really, really nice. I've seen lots of boards from different countries. Um, the British version is usually very green, um, because these, like, bright green, or Kelly green, I think, is the color tiles right here, or, uh, tile holders. But, uh, but the board is colorful because you are going to be placing letters on it as you create words. You get to have seven tiles on your rack at any moment, and you are trying to come up with the longest word that you can, kind of, to put onto the board to generate the most points possible, and that's the real goal of the game. Um, let's see, so we have a couple different places on here, right? First of all, we've got a big sack of tiles, and that sack of tiles is outlined right here. It's not a secret what's in there. We have our letter distribution, which tells me that there are nine A's in this bag, and there are is only one X. Um, there are two blanks. It's very illegal to go feeling through here, trying to find the one that's blank on both sides, um, at least in tournament play, but maybe you can get away with that in a home game. I don't know. <laughs> um, and the board itself has all of these colors all over it that tell you what kind of point values that you are getting. All the tiles, of course, have points um, at the bottom corner of them. There's an S. It's just worth one point. Um, we've got a few of them in the Scrabble name right here. A C is worth three points, a B is worth three points, an X is worth eight points, a Q is ten points. Basically, the more rare it is, the more points it's worth. So, in a sense, you want those, those premium tiles, and in a sense, you never want them because they're, they're hard to play. <laughs> um, checking in on the chat real quick. Oh my gosh, this is fantastic. Um, <laughs> hi everybody here in the chat. Uh, this is very, very cool. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mike Selinker. Uh, if you have never played Scrabble, uh, a van should swoop you up. This is one of the greatest games. It's one of the... I, oh, I love this game. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here. This is fantastic. Uh, but I'm teaching Scrabble right now. <laughs> um, I want to see real quick. So you draw seven tiles at the start. And according to the rules um, of probability, there's a one in seven chance, I think. Two, three, four, five six, seven, uh, that your first seven tiles are a bingo. You can play all of them at the same time. I only have one vowel here, so this is not looking fantastic at all. Um, ugh, 
Prat? Is that really? That might be the best I got on this one. Um, I don't think prart, sadly, is a word. Trarp, tramp, tramp, prant, prant. Hmm, 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 hmm. Um, you try to pick the biggest word you can. You try to place it on the board. First player has to place on the star, which is a pink square, so it's a double word score, so it's good to go first. Especially if you can bingo out and play all of your tiles in one go. A bingo is worth 50 extra points, which is fantastic. So you always want to get these big sevens. But you're trying to place your tiles on these colored points to get the most points possible, these colored spaces. Uh, a double letter score is amazing. So a fantastic first turn uh, would be to play. Okay, let's say we get away with Prance today. Um, play that right there to get the double word score and of course putting our p on uh one of the premium spaces to get six points so that's a double letter so then that goes it just builds and builds and builds right you're trying to do this thing where you get as many many points as possible who uh gosh darn it earlier when i was practicing this and i drew them i got expats which i think is the longest word i could play and the x one on the double letter which was pretty fantastic uh i did have the letters uh strangely for sex tape but i don't think that's actually a word in the dictionary yet who knows? Maybe someday. So um, so you play these letters, and then the next person, of course, gets their own tile. Like, I put these back on my rack, and then I draw back up to seven. My opponent has seven letters. They are going to try and play in order to make... I'm going to get Prance off the board. That's just making me sad. <laughs> um, they're going to get their own tiles, right? And they're going to try and place onto that uh, as best we can. I'm not going to play an entire game of Scrabble here for you uh, in solo mode, um, because that seems rude. Um, oh, nothing big. Maybe I want to get onto some of these triple letter scores, right? It seems like that kind of game, and really, in, in a way, Scrabble is that kind of game. You're just playing tiles, making words. It's fun. It's great. It's good times. It's a test of your vocabulary and your ability to anagram to make longer and longer words out of these letters, right? That seems like the deal, um, and for the most part, it is. So checking in on Twitch real quick. Oh my gosh, everybody. Hello. This <laughs> Crow Gould says, this Scrabble thing is interesting, like an offline Words with Friends. Um, I whew, I think I've lost more friends over Words with Friends than Scrabble, so that's that's a big positive right there, necessarily. Um, ooh, this is good. So there is there are very, very good comments coming up in, in the chat right now from Quinn, uh, Quincy33. So you don't want to get the most points possible, and let's... Uh, Let's talk about it. Let's talk about how uh, my life was changed dramatically one day um, by reading a book. Uh, I read this book right here. This book is called Word Freak. It's by Stefan Fatsis, who is a sports journalist with the uh, New York Times. Sure, let's say that. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's right. <laughs> um, and he decided that he was going to become a competitive Scrabble player. He was going to get into the scene. He had heard about it, and he wanted to see if he could challenge the experts. Having just basically this coffee table, home, you know, Scrabble knowledge that he had. He didn't have uh, a whole lot of experience, but what he had was good. He had a good foundation, good fundamentals. He knew what was going on. And so as part of this book, he decides that he's going to go around and find these classic masters who have been winning over and over and over again. And he wants to talk to them about what they did to turn their brains on in this weird Scrabble way. Like, what do they do to become the best Scrabble players in the world? And the book is incredible. There's, first of all, Scrabble has, like, this powerful pack of characters that really, really, really um, make this book very interesting. Uh, some of the, 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 the masters of this game who have really, like, taken the time to memorize tons and tons of words, lists of words, so that they can build the best uh, pseudo-vocabulary. Vocab is interesting, because a lot of these people don't know the definitions of the words, they just know the words. Because words are worth points, letters are worth numbers, numbers are points, and it's just a math game at some point, which is one of the reasons I like it, right? Um, but uh, but it's a ton of fun, because as he's going through it, he's also trying to become an expert. He's His goal is to take a test at the start of this and get basically his... Uh, uh, his Scrabble ELO, like what is his personal player level, and then he wants to raise that high enough that he can play in the expert level tournament to wrap up the book. And I believe it's a year and a half of toil and trouble in here. It is, oh my gosh, fantastic. And it also goes through the entire history of Scrabble. So it's it's a fun read if you like Scrabble. I love it a lot. But some of the things that I learned by reading this book have changed how I play the game. And uh, 
I'm sorry. I don't I don't know the, the best thing to say about it. It's uh you, you take a level and then like Quincy says, um, as you start playing this game and you start thinking about it in a more strategic sense and you realize that Scrabble right down here is not just whoops is not just um, a game with a board where you're playing a bunch of letters, but a an area control tactical strategy game. Um, the game kind of changes a whole lot. You, you get a different perspective on what's going on and how you decide to do it. Um, let me give you a couple examples of that real quick as we're, we're starting to think about. Like, uh, they, they have a lot of things to say in this book about how to get started as a Scrabble player. Um, but some of them are pretty, pretty brutal here. Jumping in real quick into the chat before I jump into this. Yes! Oh my gosh! Okay. <laughs> uh, Quincy33, I would love to talk to you more about uh, your Scrabble tournament experience. That is fantastic. I love... Oh, I want to do it so bad. Like, st what Stefan was able to do in here, I I dream. Like, that would be incredible. That would be a ton of fun. Um, but let me jump over to one of those slides that I learned. For example, do you have all of the two-letter words in Scrabble memorized yet? Uh, there's plenty of fun ones in there. Um, the list gets slightly longer. Um, every once in a while, like, za has been added lately. That is just short for pizza. That's exactly right. Um, but it is one of the only two-letter words with a Z in it. So that's fantastic. It is the only one, I believe. Yes. Uh, there's a couple of X's. There's, uh, there's of course, ones that start with X, Z, and Zoo. Um, or I guess Chi and Chu, mate. I, yeah. Um, X, X. There's lots of X's, so that's an easy one to get out of. Uh, QI is the only one with a Q. So having this list kind of in the back of your brain means that you can start to play this game in a slightly different way. Let's see if I can get some weird tiles out here. Um... Do, 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 and jump back to our scene. Uh, for example, if I start to play um, in a weirder way, let's get some, I don't know, let's get like Potter out here. There we go. Let's get some Harry Potter into the game. Um, well, with two-letter words, I can start to make stranger chains. Like, for example, I saw on that list that J-O is a word, um, and so suddenly... I don't need to play down this row. I can consider playing across this row to see if I can maximize how many points I get. Um, uh, there we go. J, uh, let's play, ooh, missing a J, an L. I wanted to play jail right there. There's an L right there. Um, uh, making Joe at it uh, lay at the same time. Hmm, gotta go check my list to see if that one's accurate, actually. I haven't, I haven't planned this out very well, and no, it would have been a fake, so I would get called out on that one. Um, uh, La, Li, and Lo all work, but L-E, no. So as we're going through this right now, I can start making words that go across, that start building up. Um, uh, and uh, and that's great. That's amazing. That, that gives me so many more possibilities because what happens in Scrabble is when you, I'm telling you all, you all know how to play Scrabble, when you <laughs> open up this board by, by making a longer word, you open up the board, right? If I can play small, tightly, restrictively, then I am breaking down the ways that you can score points on your turn by giving you fewer options. Um, the first player plays, you know, if they play a six-letter word, they've already opened up someone to play off this P and get into double word territory. If I can make a shorter, tighter word, it might take longer before we get to those. And of course, I do want to control your actions, so I don't want you to get those, those points unless, um, you know, I want those points. That's for me. That's my game. Uh, I definitely don't want to let you have access to the triple word scores, so I want to be really careful about that. They're the red ones out in the edges. And and as we move, we want to take these slow, slow, slow steps. Um, I have a good friend who also read this book, and um, his game style changed to this stifling. Like, all he wanted to do was play these two-letter words over and over and over again. And, uh, and it would just take me forever to get into this, like, high-point territory. It drove me up the wall. Um, that's my friend Aaron just for the record, <laughs> if you couldn't guess. Um, and uh, and so we we took these, these rules and these lessons and we started applying them to become better at the game. And what very quickly happened is when we would play, like we were playing in college a whole bunch and we would play together and a third friend of ours would want to play Scrabble with us and would hate it, have the worst time in the entire world because um, this kind of tactical... Scrabble play is not how we normally think about the game of Scrabble. It's really a, a word game. It's a vocabulary building game, right? So so as you gain this knowledge, and hopefully I haven't, I haven't messed it all up for you. I'm going to make it worse in a second. Um, you, uh, you know, you kind of lose that ability to, to play it a little bit more casually. Um, 
Oh my gosh, Laser in the chat mentioned a time that we played uh, Quiddler. I think it was Quiddler, <laughs> um, which is a word game, and I, you know, I've been here through this word ringer, so I, I, I think I was ruthless and terrible. Yep, yep, that was it. <laughs> um, I just got a tongue stuck out at me. <laughs> so this game, I, I really, really enjoy. Um, let's check in real quick in the chat again. I love this. I, this is a very active chat, and I really want to know what everyone's got to say in here. So this is. Fun. Oh my gosh. Boggle. Good. Fun. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Quincy mentions um, that the, the list of two-letter words does get updated. Uh, that does happen like Za was a very, very strange one, but it was one that people were very excited about because it gave them additional letter combinations. I believe there was Zo. I think Zo is acceptable in English or in the, you know, the British um, Scrabble, but not in the U.S., Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> um, Jonathan says that only I would make Scrabble a competitive game. No, 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 no. Read this book. It's like Sun Tzu in here. It's fantastic. <laughs> um, one of the other things, let's talk about like high level Scrabble play because this is one of my favorite parts. Um, we've got our, our board. We've got our letters. One of the things that you as a Scrabble master want to be ready for is the bingo because a bingo is a 50 point bonus, right? That's enormous. Whatever Potter scores three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, maybe I get a double on that, so that's another three, so eleven, and it's a double word score, so twenty-two. Whoop de doo! I played six letters. I'm not doing all that great. If I can bingo, that's a huge bonus, even if my letters are not fantastic, right? If I play a a good word on premium tiles and I use premium letters like X and Q, I can get a pretty high score. That's a pretty classic, right? We're, we're used to that one, right? I want to get a Z up here on a triple word score or a triple letter score. That stuff's fun. We know that stuff that's written into the game right here. What is not and what um, a lot of these Scrabble Masters did is, is, you know, not only looking at the two letter words or the three letter words. And when I looked them up today, there are a thousand and fifty one three letter words. Um, and again, some of them are fantastic. Some of them are words you're very used to. Some of them are not. If I go back to this two-letter list real quick, where's my favorite one? The very first one is just AA. Um, get rid of some A's right there. It's a good A dump for sure. Um, that's just a Hawaiian word for lava. It's in our, it's on our list. Um, I did have a, oh gosh, everything's gone bad over here. Don't look at my tiles. They're wrong. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, uh, my, a friend of mine did play that a few times, and that's one of the ones that gets into huge arguments, because when you look at it, you're like, that's all vowels, that's that's no word, what's going on here? And uh, brings out dictionaries and fights and combat and stuff like that. Uh, one of the other major rules of Scrabble that's important is that you don't have to play on your turn. You can exchange, right? So if you don't like the letters that you were given, you can uh, take a few of them off your rack. Say I take three of them, I put them face down, um, uh, I... I want to swap out these three. I want to exchange these three. So I pull three new ones onto my rack. I put those three back in here. Um, why would I want to do that? I mean, for sure, if I can't make a word, obviously. But usually you can make a word. I mean, it's... it's mm, Okay, usually. Usually you can. I'm going to say that. I think that's true. I haven't done the probability, so don't quote me. But what I love about it is, uh, is this gives you the opportunity to build up to better and better words. Um, and... Uh, High level players are doing a couple things. Like one of one of them is having this mastery of two and three letter words because you need those to build build chains in ways that we don't often see in kind of like casual play. But also they are looking for very very specific sets of letters that are are um, going to lead to huge point options. And so what I want to do real quick is take a look at one of them. This is not the best word stem anymore in the world, but it was for some time. Um, this is the Satine stem. And let me take a look at what this means. Uh, the Satine stem is a set of six letters, S-A-T-I-N-E, which if you have one more letter, will give you a seven letter word, will give you a bingo. So Satine plus A, you can play Intasia or Tania's. Um, Satine plus uh, U, you get aunties or Sinuate. That's fantastic, right? And so there's a little bit of memorization in here that people have done, which is, you know, trying to come up with mnemonics to remember this list right here, which I find fantastic. Um, Satine plus G, we get an ING in there. So there's some, some simple anagramming with ings in there, which is great. Eating, seating, teasing. 
which is fun intakes I like a lot. If we go over to the R's, uh, partway through that, R has a ton of options. We get retinas. Uh, retina, I believe at the moment, is a better string than satine. But uh, these change based on how, you know, which words are in the dictionary at any time and things like that. So, I love it. If you are going for... You were going for Scrabble Mastery. These are the lists that you were checking out. You were looking up the ones that have the highest probability of showing up. And if you think about the letters in Satine, uh, those are all one-point letters. They are very common in your letter distributions. It is they're likely to pull out of this bag. This bag. We're not memorizing, you know, a whole lot of things with with X's in them. I mean, it's great if they come up, and it's great if you have an X and you are able to capitalize. But the the likelihood of you having a premium tile like that is low because there's only few of them in here. Uh, as the game progresses, if people are holding on to them, that's a different story. But uh, but usually those kind of letters, I hmm, I would tend to play in shorter words that like words like jinx, you know, a word that I want to just drop down and get a ton of points. I'm not I'm not too worried about trying to get an eight letter or seven letter word out of <laughs> out of something like a J and an X. Um, but that's just me. And again, I'm not a pro. So. <laughs> So there's a different deal. Uh, there are also word lists, of course, and you can find these online pretty easily for words that have a Q without a U. I think there's a good 10 of them. Um, QI, of course. Uh, QAT is a common one. Trank, T-R-A-N-Q, um, is another one. I mean, there's a whole bunch. Uh, definitely QIS, QI can be pluralized. <laughs> That's great. Um, and so as you study these, you get to master this game a little bit more and you start playing at a higher, you know, a, a totally different conceptual level. Um, and like I said, turning this into a tactical strategy game where you are trying to keep your opponent out of these premium corners of the board, you want them to be stuck in the middle and you want them to leave you a step so that you can bust out. Uh, which again is another reason to do an exchange on your turn because if you would be the one extending the board, you can slow it down if you want to. There's, oh, there's just so many options. <laughs> it's fantastic. I love Scrabble. I love it. Please play Scrabble. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Uh, let me check in on the chat real quick because there is a ton of stuff going on. Do, do, do. Oh gosh, so many good comments in here. Yeah, so um, yeah, so I believe I was just using the uh, the American letters, um, excuse me, the American word combos for all of those. So there are the, the British level, there is also the world's level, which is so pods, um, as Quincy mentions here, because they are adding... Um, both of those dictionaries together. One of the things in this book that I find the most interesting, what are we looking at right now? Good, we're looking at me, just making sure. One of the things I find the most interesting in this book is uh, is there is a section in here where Stefan is talking to two Scrabble pros from Romania. Uh, is that right? Uh, Czechoslovakia, maybe. Um, um, and uh, they th their alphabet is, of course, totally different. It's full of the letters that we consider, you know, premium letters. It's got a bunch of Z's in it. It's got, you know, all a whole different um, letter distribution in there. And so what they have done is they have they have somehow been able to, like, think about Scrabble as a game, not a game of language, but a game of mastering the combinations that exist in the English language. And I, uh, neither of them did well. I think Stefan is talking to them and they're, like, ranked the, they're tied for last um, in the competition. But it is so interesting and it's so amazing to hear that, uh, you know, that this this game can be played, um, you know, at the world's level by people from, you know, that English is not their primary language. Uh, of course, they do have it in other languages. You can play it in uh, in Czech if you want to. Um, it's beautiful, you know, the, you'll have totally different letters and I would struggle for sure. But um, but it's it's very cool. I, I love Scrabble. I love that it has all this, this world local, localization all over the place. Uh, it's just great. Um... Let's see. What do we got in here? Um... <laughs> okay, okay. Um, Selinker in here is talking about unspeakable words a little bit. I do love unspeakable words. That is such a fun game. Uh, where is it? Oh, it's right here. There we go. Um, because you do have this opportunity to start making stuff up. You, it's, it's, you know, it's about getting words out, and it's, it's, it turns Scrabble from this like slow slogging thing into something that is much more fun. Um, I do absolutely agree with playing that game all the time. Um, I mean, Scrabble will always be a favorite for me, but unspeakable words, so good. 
All right, all right. Um, any last Scrabble thoughts? Go ahead and post them in the chat right there, but I'm gonna start cleaning this up. I gotta move on to, to game number two. Um, Scrabble, like I said, is, is an interesting one, and word games in general, I think unspeakable words, uh, as a an alternative to this, right? Word games, the more words you know, the better you are at the game, uh, generally, right? But um, but games that start to, like Scrabble, turn it into a math game is very interesting. That somehow changes the strategy very completely and gives people these other uh, possible options. It's a game that definitely not only rewards mastery, but, uh, but turns the game into something else. Um, let's go off on a weird tangent for a second. Um, in college, a good friend of mine loved the game Final Fantasy VII. It was seven. That's right. Um, <laughs> and wanted to do everything in that game. That game, oh my gosh, I'm just trying to get things out of the out of the sight line of the camera right here. Um, that game is incredible because there is this huge uh, arena. There's, like, the game itself, and then there's this arena, and then there's, like, the super perfect weapons, and blah, 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 blah. Um, and if you decide to master the game and go for those, and my friend was the one who wanted to max out the timer and play it as long as possible, you know, he, that was... Whew, he, had some, he had some time on his hands, that's for sure. But by mastering the game, when he went to go beat the game, it was just the easiest thing in the world, right? He had done something that made the game um, not unplayable, but playable in a different way, I suppose. His... Winning the game ended up being more about um, uh, this arena, mastering the arena and getting all the fights perfect that are kind of like the super, super challenges. But they don't happen before the end of the game. So then you still have to go win the game when you're done with that. And it's just like a cakewalk. You just, you know, head right through. And there are plenty of people who struggle with that game and those final bosses because they haven't gone through this huge, ridiculous process, right? So it kind of turns into a separate game at some point. Um, there are a lot of games that have this feel, uh, we're, we're going to talk about Betrayal in just a second, which does have that feel in a couple senses. We'll talk about a few of those perks in general. Um, but just looking around, right? Most games, the, the better you are at them, the more you play them, the more familiar you are, the more familiar you are, excuse me, um, the better you are at building these strategies and coming up with new ones, right? So let's get into it. Let's get into the next one. Do, 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 do. Um... Uh, Crow Gold asks, I wonder if Scrabble would work in a language like Chinese or Japanese. I don't know. That's a really great question. I, I want to check that out. <laughs> um, yes, and Final Fantasy VII is the best, although I'm going to tell you, I love Ten Two, 2 and I may be in a minority on that one, but holy cow, uh, Ten Two 2 is wonderful. Bye, Etta. So good to see you. Thanks for stopping by. This is great. Um, it's just cool to see everybody. Oh my gosh. I love this. I'm so happy today. <laughs> Um, all right, let's let's see if I've got things in the right zone because I want to start talking about game number two for today, the wonderful Betrayal at House on the Hill. This is uh, the third copy of this that I've owned. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Um, I love the game, so it's good. It needs multi you know I need that many copies. Um, here we go. The game starts simply. Oh my gosh! Bam, bam, bam! Look at this. Um, do do do. Get these knocked out here. Right? I love it, because Betrayal is a game that starts uh, do, 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 slow, starts small, and uh, and gives you the ability to expand the game in such a ridiculous way. Uh, in Betrayal at House on the Hill, you are an explorer. You are one of ten. I'm <laughs> ten. You're one of five little wonderful explorers here that are going to be traveling throughout this house. You all begin in the entrance hall and get to explore. Okay, uh, cool. <laughs> uh, you're trapped in the haunted house, you can't get out, uh, and your job is to uncover a mystery within the house, uh, solve that mystery, and uh, survive, I suppose, is generally one of the requirements of the game, though not always. You can still win, as long as the heroes win, um, if you're a hero and you don't make it through. Um, of course, like, kind of looking through the house is a pretty difficult task all on its own, so there's a whole lot going on. Uh, this is pretty zoomed out, we'll be adding some more stuff in here real quick. Um, because the the house is enormous. You don't even know how big it is when you get into the house. All you have is a couple ground floor rooms. You have the entrance hall, the foyer. You have some stairs that go up to the upper landing. Put you over here. That makes a little bit more narrative sense. And you also know that there is a basement, but you don't know how to get to it, which is great. <laughs> um, so 
from here on your turn, your turn is pretty simple. You're going to play one of our heroes. Bam. Um, and, uh, and our heroes have these wonderful uh, pentagonal character boards right here. I love them. Um, and they're all different. All the characters are different. They're all also two-sided and on both sides. So this one is Professor Longfellow. And on the back is, of course, Father Reinhardt. Um, the characters have different bonuses like different things that they are good at and then also just generally different damage tracks which is very interesting i'm gonna i'm gonna see if we can do some extreme close-up here do 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 our professor right here has a speed track that starts at two uh, maybe i'll do this way haha <laughs> starts at two and goes up to six right um that means the professor is never going to be extremely fast because these scores can go up to eight um and starts at the green number there we go uh, starts at a speed of four, but that can drop as the professor takes physical damage. Um, they can gain in these traits. They can go up and up and up. But as they go down, there's a skull down there at the very bottom, and you want to avoid that skull. If you hit that skull um, in the second half of the game, you are dead. Um, in the first half of the game, you're just terrible. You're just <laughs> really bad at doing things. But uh, you still survive and get to play the game. Um all of the different characters have different tracks. So, for example, uh, Professor Longfellow, as you might expect, is our knowledge star. Starting at 5, going up to 8. The lowest his knowledge can ever get is a 4. Of course, Sanity, you can see a 1 there, right before the skull. So, that, you know, the Professor can get pretty, uh, pretty, get stuck in a struggle for Sanity. There we go. There's a way to say that. And, uh, and it's great. It's fun. It's perfect. These scores are going to change all the time. Uh, there are wonderful little uh, uh, coffin tracks that go up and mark exactly where you are at any moment. Um, the theme is fantastic and has been forever. Okay. Uh, so you want to explore this house? Fantastic. You are going to dig through the room stack, <laughs> um, which is just this enormous stack of rooms. Um, you know what? You know, just for the record, uh, everyone should learn how to shuffle these tiles. This is the best game to teach you how to shuffle tiles. Uh, it makes you look super, super cool. Um, that's what I say. <laughs> um, as you decide to explore the house, you are going to be looking through for basically the floor that you're on. The room stack has three different levels, upper, ground, and basement. Some of these rooms can be placed in any of those. Some of the rooms can only be placed in one of the floors. Um, and you go down these in order. And so you don't exactly know what's going to come up at any moment. So if I have the professor with that speed of four decide to move one and then two to explore this room, they would flip over this first tile, which says it can go in the ground floor and find a hallway. Uh, I've still got movement left. I have nothing that has told me to end my turn. So I'm going to continue to look. That was one, two movements. And I'm just going to start moving until I see another ground tile. And I will place the dining room. Every one of these rooms, um, the hallway is, a, is an exception, there are a few of those exceptions, I suppose, um, has a symbol on it, and that symbol is either a raven or a bull's head or a little spiral, and you'll notice those are the three symbols on these decks of cards out here, omens, items, and events. Uh, I need to place so that the doors line up with the room, or, or with the house that exists at any moment. Uh, these are totally modular, so I can move the upper and basement to wherever I want. Um, I realize I'm explaining the game right now, and Mike Selinker is in the chat, like, probably explaining the entire game to everybody. Uh, <laughs> I feel a little silly about that, but uh, thank you for uh, uh, humoring me, everybody. <laughs> um, so, our professor is going to go over here into the dining room and is going to gain an omen card. Uh, these decks are all filled with wonder and joy. <laughs> um uh, the events are terrifying, they're wonderful, they're great. Uh, items are always a ton of fun things to have that can be one-use items or they can be longer-term effects. Uh, but the game is built around these omen cards. Um, they are the most important ones, they are going to drive what happens. They are the secrets to the mystery that is unfolding all around you. So, maybe you find a strange book, it's a diary or lab notes. Um, maybe it's ancient scripts or modern ravings, who knows? Uh, you might find a spear. Um, a Spear of Destiny, who knows? Uh, magic Rings, there's a dog to help out. There's a girl trapped in the room uh, all alone. You have a mask that's, you know, it's just all of these omens are wonderful. Um, and when you get them, they're going to change how the game works for you. They're all going to give you special abilities and things that you can do. They are fun. 
I'm going to say that right now. They're fun. Uh, many, most, you'll see this is the thickest deck, um, of the rooms have events. And events are varied. They're all different. There's all sorts of things. Um, oh, I'm not going to read my favorite creepy one. <laughs> um, a lot of these cards do reflect like horror ideas, right? That's where, where all of this stuff is coming from. So there are certainly some cobwebs in the game that are going to be creepy and you're going to need to try and break through that. Most of them have a check for you to make in the game and to roll checks in this game, you basically take your stat and, uh, and, uh, roll a number of dice equal to that stat. That's the whole game. Your stat will go up and down. That'll give you a few dice, fewer dice, more dice to, to roll with. And these dice are some of my favorite dice in the world. They are D3 minus ones. So the only faces are zero, one, and two. I love that there's a zero face. You can roll five dice and get no results. It's great. Uh, let's say our professor is, is casually trying to break through some webs. Um, they must attempt a might roll. Uh, the professor, as you might expect, only has a might of three. So we'll roll these three dice. We'll see what happens. I get a total of two pips up there. So I read the card because it tells me everything I need to know. If I had rolled a four plus, I would have broken free, gained one might, and discarded this card. However, with a two, I'm stuck. I'm going to keep this card. Um, and I can't do anything until I'm free. Other people have to come save me from the webs by making might checks. Of course, I can also try uh, myself. Um, and after a few people have been unsuccessful, once we get through three of those unsuccessful attempts, we're going to break free, take our turn normally, and move on. Some of these events stay in play. There's things like secret passages that will guide you through the house and give you different options, um, uh, which are fantastic. Um, there are hidden treasures. All sorts of things to to give you bonuses throughout the game. It's fun to explore. That's the best part of the game, right? You're, you're exploring a haunted house. It should be fun. And it is. And sometimes it's super, super creepy. Um, oh my gosh. Checking in on the chat uh, again. Yes, Mike Selinker. It is Jacob's game that is the creepiest one in here. <laughs> uh, ooh, no, Jonah's turn is the one I was thinking of. Um, now I want to find Jacob's game. Do, 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 do. Uh, I think it might be the, the same card. Um, oh, it's so good. Everything is so wild and creepy. Um, <laughs> haunts, just like Scrabble. That's right. The Scrabble haunted game. All right, let's see. Um, I want to talk about mastery in this game, right? So I want to talk about where we're headed. Uh, we get the basic rules. Uh, actually, we're not done with the basic rules. We've skipped the entire second half of the game. Uh, whenever you get an omen, bam, uh, you are going to take... Uh, six of these dice, and you're going to roll them. Okay, well, no, that's not going to happen this time. If you manage to roll fewer pips than the number of omens that are currently in play, you will trigger the haunt. Uh, the haunt is the second half of the game, and it is uh, where things get wild. Um, <laughs> Betrayal at House on the Hill comes with two rule books, um, which you are not allowed to read. Uh, one of them is The Secrets of Survival, and one of them is The Traitor Tome. Uh, you are not allowed to look in these. They say do not read pretty prominently on there um, until you are told to. When the haunt occurs, one of the players is going to betray everyone else, more than likely, and, uh, and the game is going to suddenly, you know, we're going to have our mystery. We're going to figure out what's going on. We're going to, to try to escape from this house, stop the villain, defeat a monster, who the heck knows? It could be anything. Uh, the original game comes with 50 wonderful haunts. Um, I remember playing the the first... Like, I still remember stories about these haunts. Um, I absolutely remember one haunt um, where I was the traitor. And uh, just to give you an example, I was invincible. And the traitor's tome just said, you're invincible, kill everybody. And it, was, it was like a paragraph or something like that. Um, meanwhile, the secrets of survival, the heroes had this ridiculously detailed plan to um, somehow perform a ritual to break my invincibility and then defeat me. It was one of the coolest games um, I can remember. Of course, they're, I mean, they're all, they're so good. There's so many good things in here for sure. Um, but everything changes. One person is going to betray everyone. They're going to basically split up into two different rooms. Each one of them is going to take one of these books. You're going to read the brand new rules and you're going to play that game, whatever it is. And in the first phase of the game, you have no idea what it's going to be. So you're exploring to kind of gain items, to gain omens, to become more powerful, to gain stats, to help you out 
in that phase. But at the same time, you're just exploring because it's fun to do. You want to get to the hunt. You want to see what kind of, you know, ridiculous, random, monstrous stuff happens to everybody. It's beautiful. All right, now have I explained it <laughs> uh, well enough. Let's see. Uh, 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 uh. Okay, yeah, it was Jonah's turn. Absolutely. Gosh, what a well-written card. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about um, some of the things that you can do in this game. Are we ready? Have you all played Betrayal enough that, that I can start to, to give away a couple of these secrets? I do love this game. Um, but there are some things that you can definitely do because the game to sway, you know, the opportunity for you to win this game um, uh, in your favor. Was that a sentence? Who the heck knows? Um, we do like to win games, right? And this is one that at the end, like at the beginning, is this open world exploration style game. I want to go upstairs. I want to find the basement. I want to go look around, um, see what kind of creepy things happen. I want to get through this event deck. I want to have experiences. But in the second half, it's now competitive. And uh, one someone is going to lose the game. And it's a game where all of us were kind of wandering around, kind of willy-nilly for a while, and then suddenly someone ends up on a different team, and we, we see what happens. The haunt can take quite a while. Sometimes it can be pretty fast. It all depends on, on the haunt and what the house looks like. It depends on this haunt roll in particular. There are certainly times when this haunt roll can happen, and there's only two omens out, and we have like eight rooms in the whole place. Or sometimes... Everyone rolls really well, and we've been hanging out for, you know, an hour building this enormous house, and and finally, um, <laughs> we get a haunt, and that person is in a lot of trouble, because all the all the rooms that we need in order to succeed at the haunt are clear to see, or things like, you know, who knows? It could be anything. Um, what else? What else we got here? Um, so, mastery. Are we ready? Are we ready? Let's master it up. I don't want to give away all the secrets because I love this game and you should play it without knowing all these secrets. But still, I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to open the Trader's Tome to the first page, which you actually have to. This is really important. You need the haunt chart. It tells you what haunt you're going to play. And uh, one of the things about it is it is based on which omen you find and which room you find it in. So, for example, if we had picked up the book in the dining room, I would just quickly scan through this table, and I would say, book, dining room, and that's going to tell me, down here at the bottom, who is the haunt, or who is the traitor in the game. Um, and there are all sorts of things, and I'm never going to be ready for them, so don't don't think that's, that's going to be possible. Uh, you'll never, like, make sure you're the traitor for the most part, but being the traitor is fun. Being the traitor can sometimes be an advantage to you in winning the game. Uh, you get to read a book all by yourself, which is really fun. And uh, it's just sometimes nice to beat everybody else, which, you know, in a, everybody else is playing cooperatively, so they're all going to win together. Wouldn't you just want, like to beat everybody at once? Um, mild secrets of this book. Are you ready? Ready? A lot of these ask you for the highest stat. Sometimes they ask for the lowest stat. So maybe some of them say the highest knowledge. Maybe some of them say the lowest sanity. Um, having all your stats in the middle means you're not going to be a traitor if any of those come up. Uh, also, many of these happen to the Haunt Revealer. And so if you are the person who found the book, and if you are the person who messed up the haunt check, odds are you can be a traitor all by yourself. So a big part of this game, if that's your focus, if being the traitor sounds fun to you, is uh, is finding these omens. Of course, if being a traitor does not sound fun to you, <laughs> um, and I know plenty of people who playing this game for the first time are like, oh no, I'd have to go and like learn the rules by myself. That sounds really hard. I don't know. I don't know if that's my thing. Uh, and I always allow people to like opt out <laughs> of being the traitor because it is kind of a scary task. Um, I am nice in that way. Uh, also, it ups the odds that I will be the traitor. So um, it's kind of self-serving. But uh, as you go through, if, if you want to be the traitor, look for omens. So we'll talk in just a second about where those omens are um, located in our massive deck right here. So let's see. Uh, uh, um... Oh, I like this. Uh, <laughs> just checking the chat out real quick. You can definitely tell that the producer, Miss Marzipan, is right off camera running the show. Marzipan is five feet away from me, asleep on a pillow right now. It's wonderful. Um, I've said her name, so now she's not asleep, but here we are. Um, technically, you can get the omen roll. You can get uh, the haunt to happen on the first omen in the first round. You can roll all blanks on these. Um, I have seen it happen. Doesn't happen very often, of course, probability, but still, it's, it's brutal when it does. 
Um, let's talk about this house a little bit. Let's talk about the house. Let's break it down. We have our event deck right here, and our event deck is brutal. It can be so many, so many different things, right? There's so many options here. And many of these have these tables on them where you need to make a check, and the checks are random. And uh, if you fail, you will be, you're will be going to be kind of hurt. Some of them give you a bonus when you succeed at them. There are very few that don't do anything if you fail at the check. So events are terrifying. Um, I'm always scared when I get an event because it's, you know, a, the possibility exists that my stats will go down. And when our stats go down, we get closer to death. And that's not a position I want to be in as a hero or a trader in the second half. Um, I want to make sure my stats are as high as possible. So as I'm looking for, looking through this house, getting events is often scary. Items, always good. 100% always good. Um, geez, I just said that like I know for sure. Um, there are some that have some downsides to them, but none of these are you explode. Um, which is different than the omen deck, because an omen hunter who goes through the omen deck, one of them is a bite, and you will get bit, and it sucks. <laughs> you just get hurt um, by your friend. I use, you know, oh, uh, the the card says when when you draw the bite, the person to your right, I believe, needs to roll an attack against you, um, and it's every single time I lose so many of my physical points. So my physical or speed and might, they're both going to start dropping. You have to make choices about like. I don't know, do I want to be stronger or do I want to be slower as I explore the house? Strength is really good in the second half when you have to fight monsters, but speed lets you explore in the... F oh, it's, ugh, it's such a balance. Like, losing stats is really, really hard. So, but in general, omens are good, and omens are going to make it more likely that you become the traitor. So that's fun. That's how I want to play. I want to be the traitor. <laughs> I love it. Um, items are good, but they are rare. Um, but they do give you plenty of bonuses, and they make you a much stronger character in the game. Events can up your stats, but they can remove your stats as well. There are also a couple buildings in here that it's useful to know about as we get started. Let's run through. Do, do, do. See, I'm running through and I see a storeroom. It's got a little bull symbol on it. The game room, it's got an events. Dusty hallway, it's got nothing. There are some hallways um, in here. Uh, here we go. The gymnasium uh, is an omen card, or is an omen uh, room. And it says once per game, if you end your turn here, gain one speed. So there are there is one room for each of the stats. Getting those is pretty helpful. Of course, it means you have to go into that room, and if you're the first person to go in, you still get the omen or the item uh, or the event, whatever it is, but the second person to go in does not get those things. They have to walk into a room, end their turn, without drawing a card. Generally, your turn ends when you draw a card. There's a couple things that, that change that, but drawing a card is always good because stuff gets to happen. Walking into a room and just upping a stat while, you know efficiently good uh, is not always fun so uh, I always worry about those I want to open rooms um, but there are a couple really really good rooms okay what did we say items are good uh, well what if you could oh my gosh I gotta find it in this deck uh, um, what if you could open a vault what if you could bust open the vault it is for me the best room in the entire game um, I mean, it should be. It's a vault, right? You want to be in a haunted house and find someone's locked vault. Uh, it begins locked. The first time you open it, you get an event. Or the first time you walk into the room, there is an event. However, there is some text in here that says you can attempt a knowledge roll of 6 plus to open it and empty the vault. So this is as likely to happen... Um, well, I was going to say as a haunt, let's, let's not compare those. Uh, a 6 is a very high roll. That's uh, one of the rare... Usually they go up to 4. Um... Something that you want to have happen, like in the, the haunt, for example, is often a three. Like you, We want it to be tense, but not too tense. It's about a three. Um, four is like, oh my gosh, you really got to be lucky in order to get this. But this one's a six. And if you do it, you get two item cards. And that is huge. That's a, a big, huge swing for you as a character. Um, which leads to a very, very common strategy. I'm guilty of it. I admit it. Um, well, if I look at the characters in here, some of them have more knowledge than others. And if I pick one of those characters and then I race upstairs and I start searching for the vault, um, odds are I'm going to spend a few turns, but eventually I'm gonna get two items out of it, which is one of the best, like I said, one of the best things you can do. Um, of course, by walking into the vault and 
the first time I walk into the vault, I have to, you know, I draw an event card, my turn ends. The second time someone goes into the vault, they just step in, try the check, and if they fail, they can walk back out and go somewhere else, right? So, you know, it doesn't end your turn in order to do that. Um, and so you can use that as part of your exploration. You can do some pretty tight stuff in, in the upstairs, like trying to stay pretty close as long as you have a high enough speed that you can wander through. Um, often uh, some other character will figure out my strategy and go try and do the same thing, but um, they've picked a different character, and so I'm better at it than they are. Um, which is fun. <laughs> I'm a monster. You know me. That's why you're here listening to me. Um, oh my gosh, so many notes on here. Um, <laughs> I have not mentioned this yet. Uh, I do have uh, the box right here because it does make me really, really happy. Um, do, 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 do. I gotta go check. Um, there we go. Um, a few years back, an expansion to Betrayal at House on the Hill came out. Uh, the Widow's Walk expansion featuring 50 new haunts. Ooh, get my glare going there. Um, and also very, very, well, a couple cool things about it. First of all, the list of contributors is pretty fantastic. And, um, if you check, I don't know, right there, that's my name. It's right there. Um, uh, that's fantastic. Um, uh, I, I just love being part of this. Uh, Laser's also on here. We both did a haunt together. It's called Cat O'Clock. Um, and, uh, you get to name a cat. It's the best thing in the world. That table is fantastic. Um, other thing about this that I like is there is a legacy mechanic. Um, there are four, four haunts, I believe. Um, I mean, Mike knows these better than I do, of course. Um, that lead to, they're all like seasonal haunts and they lead you to a big finale at the end of it if you've done all four of them. Which I think is very cool. Um, I haven't gotten through all of them yet. I've not finished the legacy. <laughs> Someday. Uh, let's get back down to my scene here. Uh, which hasn't changed dramatically lately. Let's see if we can fix that. Uh, 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 uh. Ooh. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. If you have if you are a big fan of Betrayal and you have not picked up Widow's Walk, like it adds so many more interesting, amazing, wacky, wacky, wacky haunts. Um, you should definitely try them out. And uh, gosh, it's fun. There's so much good stuff in there. So many great ideas. I love that game. Uh, what else do we got here? So, so I want to go hunting for this vault, of course. Um, certain... And if I am the knowledge character, that's going to be my deal. Um, other things that you can do to increase the odds that you are going to do well in this game. Uh, there are a couple characters. Um, there are the red character. Um, Two-sided. Um, this is the character that on one side has ox bellows, which starts with a might of five. Uh, that can go all the way up to eight. Um, ox bellows is terrifying. And when ox bellows is the traitor, ox bellows comes and beats you up and you lose the game. That's how that works. Um... On the other side is Flash Williams, who is the fastest character in the game, starting with a speed of six. So easily able to race through this place um, and get a little bit farther away than everybody else can, potentially. Um, being near other people can be very terrifying near the end of the game, because if I want to come hit you, if our professor is a monster and wants to come hit you, I have to make sure that my speed enough is, is high enough to get into the room with you in order to do that attack. Um, also, getting out of a room with enemies in it takes additional speed to do so there's there's a bunch of reasons to have more speed to evade and avoid and, and move throughout this place in the second half of the game so having a high speed is super useful um we also have uh of course like i said earlier the father and the professor um the professor is the highest knowledge um potentially i have to double check that one i gotta check my favorite jenny um uh, where are you, Jenny? Um, oh, nope, nope, nope. Professor is the highest, period. Um, Jenny is a big bump. Um, uh, ooh. Yep, and Heather Granville, the purple character, also is very high knowledge, but not quite as high as the professor can potentially get. Um, on the back, Father Reinhardt is the master of sanity, of course. So these characters make it very strong for you in the endgame if they are focused on a single stat. Uh, they have certainly weaknesses, but um, but having that like overwhelming ability, especially Ox Bellows, to attack is huge. Uh, it's a major, major bonus. Um, excuse me. Uh, next highest for Might, I believe, is Brandon Jaspers, who is uh, 12 years old, and his hobbies are computers, camping, and hockey. 
Um, but I love playing Peter Akamoto, who is all about bugs and basketball. One of my favorite characters right there. Um, pretty solid all around. Many of the other characters are solid throughout their stats. It's not like you're playing a character that is worse uh, if you do not pick red or white. Um, but they are those are very good at one thing. And if that one thing comes up, they're going to be really good at it. Uh, since the event deck is so random, it does mean that, you know, if Father Reinhardt gets stuck on a bunch of might challenges, Father Reinhardt only has a might of two, gonna fail all the time, all day long. So there's some back and forth there, but it is cool to have these, like, huge variations because it's it's fun and it gives you someone to be like, I'm so mad at you. Uh, you're always more strong than I am, or you're always faster than me. Um, but in the haunt... In the haunts. Okay, let's pretend I don't just want to be the traitor. Maybe I just want to win the game by all of our friends, like, building through, you know, getting through this ridiculous house uh, together. Oh, my gosh. Oh, do, do, do. Oh, I found a coal chute. Fantastic. Finally, a way to the basement. Um, and there's a collapsed room. Yet another way to get to the basement. We get a kitchen out here and some gardens out past the kitchen. That's nice. Um, the bigger this room gets, like the bigger the house gets, the more maybe you want Flash to be running through to gather items for you because maybe you need that to complete a ritual. You got to get all these items, so Flash is super helpful. Um, you gotta, you have to be able to create a plan with your people and get them moving around to enact that plan in the best way possible. I think being a hero in this one and trying to come up with the team tactics to beat the, the traitor is so much fun and it is such a different game than the traitor game is where you know you're trying to enact this master plan and defeat your you know your former friends and there are tons of different ways to do it. Um Oh, I got a little off track there, <laughs> but uh, exploring throughout the whole place, having means to explore, having a purpose is very, very good. Like in the end of the game, if the heroes have someone who is fast, that's good. That means you can get stuff. If you have someone who is strong, great. They can fight monsters. Um, often some of the abilities that you need are about knowledge and sanity that will allow, allow you to like search and find specific objects or complete certain rituals. You want to make sure you have people who are good at kind of all those things if you want the best chance of winning. So if you are here to be a hero and you want to build the best team, do that. Um, of course, if your strong person turns into the traitor, well, good luck, I suppose. Um, what else, how else can you manipulate the chances in this game that you become a traitor? Uh, I will certainly say through my incomplete probabilistic study of this game, the basement is like full of omens, like get down there and get some omens. <laughs> um, Getting omens is the greatest way to become the traitor, uh, because the haunt revealer becomes the traitor so often, and probably you're good at other stuff too, so you just increase your odds. Um, the basement is terrifying, because once you get down to the basement, uh, again, if I get down through a coal chute, that's not like a two-way trip. I'm not getting back out of there, uh, I believe unless I have a rope or something um, from the item deck. So once I get down to the basement, now I'm searching around the basement trying to find the stairs back up so that I can come up to the foyer and join everyone else in the rest of the house. Um, maybe on the on the way I find like a mystic elevator that helps me out or, or something else, you know. There's all sorts of things there. But getting down to the basement is a very cool way to, number one, be alone. Because um, if you fall down, usually people don't want to fall down with you because it hurts. Um, maybe they do, who knows. Um, but also because you just get a ton of omens and getting omens, like I said, is good for you. Um, so... As you're playing Betrayal, use your exploration phase to build yourself up to be the best trader that you can possibly be. That's uh, that's my best advice in this game. And the way to do it is to know who your character is and start racing through. Playing this game with people for the first time is a ton of fun because it is this, this game where you get to explore a story, right? You are... You were learning things about this house. You were having fun with all the events. Uh, you were trying out these, these haunts, just seeing what happens. But as you play the game, you get used to these cards. You know the good traits. You know the good omens. Um, you know what you want over here. Um, and, uh, and you start building a strategy. And you start planning it out. And everybody else is doing the same thing. When you play this game with people for the 12th time, <laughs> you're, you're playing it a lot differently than you did the first time. You're moving through the house. You're grabbing things. Um, and that somehow, sometimes, like Scrabble, makes it hard to play again with people who are brand new to the game. Um, not saying this is an impossible one. This is not a game that once you have hit a level of mastery, you can no longer play with other people. It's not Scrabble. Um, uh, right, because in Scrabble, you it, once you learn a word, 
You can't unlearn that word. That's very difficult. And it's very hard to play if someone says, you can't play double A. That's not a, I've never heard of that word, so you can't do it. Like, that's not what any of us want to be doing. So mastery in that game is a little bit different than in this one. Um, this is absolutely a game that you can master. You can come up with strategies. You can come up with tactics and, uh, and still play it with your friends who have never played it before. Of course, it will be to your benefit. And I don't mean this to be a total advertisement, but here we go um, to play with a bunch of brand new haunts right here in Widow's Walk. Um, do get this and, uh, you know, definitely when you play Cat O'Clock, tweet at us your cat name. Um, I, I, I love it. I love every cat name that we get to hear about. All right, I'm going to check the chat one last time, see what folks are up to. But the oven is telling me that it is noon and we are just about done for the day. Um, do, do, do. All right. Oh, ooh, the chat has gone a good bit. I'm that's fantastic. I'm glad you've all been talking about stuff. Um, do, do, do. Um, okay. So F absolutely by widow's walk that, that's certainly in there. Um, Oh my gosh, yes, of course, so uh, Betrayal Legacy, I have not played yet. I've been saving up until we get the perfect team to do it. Uh, I do want to play that game. Uh, that is funny, Mike, that you did not tell Rob Davio that you were <laughs> doing a Legacy Haunt. Uh, that's fun. Um, what else? Um, Double Clicks Live says that the thing I find hardest about Betrayal is playing with people who have played a lot. Yeah, it's true. I know. I know me. Um, yeah. And the biggest thing that I would do if you're playing this with new players, especially if you are an experienced player, offer people the option not to be the traitor. Just just say, like, look, it's your first time. Uh, there's going to be a point in this game where one person has to stand in the bathroom for a while and read a book on their own. And you're not going to be able to ask us for clarifying questions about the rules. I mean, you can, but then we'll know some of your secrets. So you don't want to do that. It's not to your benefit to do that. That's fine. It's totally fine. Just, just let them be like, I don't want to do it. Um, Let's see. I try really... Well, I don't know. I'm going to find out after this whether I try really hard to make this good for new players still. Uh, or whether I am a monster the whole time. Um, I am very excited. I have been watching the news about uh, uh, Mike Selinker, excuse me, Mike Selinker's new game, Hide Society. I really, really, really want to see it. I'm excited to play it. Whew. Okay. I've caught up, I've caught up, I think, with all your questions, all your comments, all your stuff. Um, thank you so much for being here. I, I hope that this has been an interesting look at these two games. Um, and just the idea in general of mastering a game. I think it's a it's a, a worthy goal. There are a bunch of games up here on our shelves that could be mastered. Um, Vast, for example, is a game that I think about as a game where you are learning how to play the game because everybody's playing a brand new role all the time and you're trying to figure out what the heck you're doing and how to win not exactly knowing what other players are all about. I have never played a game of Vast where all of us knew all of the rules perfectly and could play a mastered game. It's, but if you get to that point, it's a different game. Um, Rise of Tribes, totally a game. That, there's my finger. Uh, once you master that game, you start playing it in a different way. Your speed increases. Playing in tournaments there is ridiculous. And um, you really have to like, you know, be careful when you have are playing a game that you have mastered with new players. Um, you gotta be be willing to like pull back that throttle a little bit. Stop looking for optimal tactics. Um, be a teacher in the game. Like show people what options are, um, how to get better at the game themselves. Because there are a lot of games that are good when all of you that are playing are masters of the game. That's fun. I'm not gonna say that's not fun, and that's not a worthy goal. Just make sure that you are taking all of your new players and bringing them along with you as best you can as you're doing it. All right, I think we've done everything we can for today. Uh, Oven says it's 12.04. Oh my gosh. Um, this has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate you all being here and uh, checking out another um, episode of Atomic Game Theory Game School. If you would like to learn more, um, you can check out more, uh, more these videos, essays, older videos, all sorts of stuff on AtomicGameTheory.com. You can also tweet at me at rmalina or follow me there. Um, I usually can't shut up about games and you'll definitely know about all of the future episodes of this show that are coming up, right? So that's fun. Um, this has been a ton of fun. My name is Richard. This has been great. I hope I get to see you all next week as we do another episode of Game School. Um, gosh, I'm so dang excited. This has been a ton of fun. Thanks a lot. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Sundays. Bye.